instinctive habit. So even though often our intellectual understanding could be correct or in line with reality, our behaviour is out of sync with reality because <coughs> our behaviour is driven by instinctive habits, our grasping. So that's what we need to shift. And the only way we can shift that is through Vipassana practice. I struggled between the first two, between the feeling and the, the um, body scan. Yep. For me, feelings are, at least, I, th I thought they were physical sensations that then I have evaluations over. Right. So yeah. I didn't, I, didn't right. I struggled with the second right. one. This word feeling is coming from the Sanskrit Vedana. And it really means, and again, when you see the word feeling in Buddhism, it's nothing to do with emotions. Um, this word Vedana is, ex is experiencing things as pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. We can do this at a mental level or a sensory level. When it's done at a sensory level, i.e. in the body, that word Vedana is often translated as sensation. Pleasant sensations in the body. But equally well, we can have a pleasant experience in the mind. Then the word Vedana is often translated as feeling. But it's the same word, and it's the same term. <coughs> so here, when we talk about pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, we're talking about that in all the six spheres, mental and sensory. That's all Vedana. That's all feeling. Okay. Yeah. I have two questions. First one. Uh, is the concept of time is only the experience of impermanence changing <clears throat> change will so the, the question is about the concept of time is that how does that relate to impermanence um, maybe we'll talk more about that later but the brief answer is that time is a concept that we have created to understand reality. But wouldn't it be gone and impermanence, if things were permanent? Impermanence is a concept that we have created to explain reality. <laughs> but more later. More later. Okay, so second question. Uh, There is something scary about change. Like how yes. you keep looking for... And that's coming. Okay. And, yeah, I believe it is coming. I just want to ask if the shamatha can be different when I'm looking at my body or looking at my mind. Like different. I feel, I feel that I'm more, uh, I can be more constant. Like my shamatha, it's better when I'm uh, investigating my body than investigating my body, my, my mind and the awareness. And that's the case for most people. For many people, their shamatha is better observing the body than the mind. And that's because the physical is easier to focus on generally than the mental. And mental, many of us have very strong habit to get caught up. Okay. So that's, that's common. But some people are actually sort of the opposite. They find observing the mind is easier than in the body. Like the clear, the, like the clear um, focus. I become dull when I'm looking at my mind. Yeah, yeah. And, and many people are the opposite. Many people become very dull when they look at the body and they're very alert when they're looking at the mind. So everyone's different. And therefore, as a shamatha practice, we should pick the object that works best for us because if we use that we can progress faster and then later we can also be very clear with all the different objects not just the one we're using in shamatha practice so it's better to do shamatha on the body and like on the breath then if that works better for you yes not to improve but but one thing is with shamatha practice what object to use is not necessarily the one that's easiest that's why I'm asking. Because if we're not enthusiastic about it, like if okay. maybe the breath is the easiest but we, don't, we find it boring, it's not going to work. I mean, same as everything in our life, we're never going to put effort into something that we find boring. So either you make it interesting or you change the object. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise it's not going to work. 
Yeah, then we'll go on to this morning's topic. Um, so, one of the hardest things, if not the hardest, I think, to investigate in permanence um, is the, uh, the, the visual things. Exactly. Like, for example, to look at the, at the blackboard and to understand sure. that this is also changing. Yes, so the yes. But this is something that I don't actually see. This is something that I know now because nowadays we have the science and we have all the theories. So my question is, if you would ask me like a couple of hundred years ago to do exactly the same, I wouldn't be able to know that the blackboard is changing. So but, how did they come to the conclusion but, that this is also in front Yeah, but what we can do with the visual, and it's because it's the limitation of our sense faculty. I mean, if our sense faculty was highly developed, we could see the very subtle momentary changes, but we, our sense faculty is not that good. So what we can do is, is observe, and then of course over time we can see that it, there is some slight change, and then from that we can come to understand that is it the fact that that thing is there really static for a certain amount of time, and then suddenly it's something else or the fact that over time it's moved from this to this does that sort of really would imply that there's a, a gradual change even though we can't see it so you're right the, the visual is is harder to perceive because of the limitation is this what they did like a, a few like a few thousand years ago when they they did they look for example at the metal cup and for a very long time and did it change I think you can apply the the impermanence to all the other fields and then from that you can really understand that the visual is the same. Mm. Also, the nature. But also you can look, I mean, the lighting sure, changes. Yeah. 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 And of course there are, exactly, there are cert certain <laughs> physical objects that you can see changing very quickly. But like in the nature? In the nature, yeah, like like water moving, light, all of these things. Yeah. Um, for me, when I tried to um, observe the visual field, I didn't like see. My God, looked at her shirt. I didn't see the shirt change, but I saw my visual field change. Like I saw at some moment I could see it better, and at some moment I could see it a bit blurrier. So is this? But that's also impermanence of the faculties, yes, very good. What about the manifestation of the emotions? I was observing the emotions, and in some occasions the window was so small that it triggered the already the physical manifestation of the emotion, like tears. Sure. So I was I was observing that. Right. Does that mean that's already grasping, or, or it just trigger that? Um, sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's two things here. There is the emotion arising, and that emotion arising can more or less instantaneously trigger some thing in the body. That's one thing. The second thing is when it's arising and it's already triggering something in the body. What do we do with that? Are we just observing it? If we do, it'll quickly pass and the things in the body will quickly pass. If not, we get caught up in it, it'll get stronger and more things happening in the body. So just the arising is not grasping, but then usually the grasping happens very quickly as soon as we notice it. Okay, let's go to this morning's topic. So remember yesterday we said that in the Theravada Buddhist traditions... Um, when we do Vipassana practice, we're mainly focusing on these three marks of existence, impermanence, suffering, and no self. And the assertion here within the Four Noble Truth teachings is that the fundamental ignorance we are that's trapping us in samsara is grasping to self. That we overinflate the sense of me and we're grasping onto this autonomous me, a me that seems to be something more than just the body and the mind here. And the, the assertion is that if we realise there's no such autonomous self, we can eliminate all mental afflictions and suffering and achieve liberation. So therefore, in this system of teaching, 
it's accepted that there is a objective independent world out there. So how we see the world is not a problem. There is an objective world out there independent of us. It's only how we see ourselves as a person. That's the problem. We overinflate the sense of me. Whereas in the Mahayana Buddhist traditions, based on these perfection of wisdom teachings of the Buddha, the Buddha went on and said, well, actually, there's a deeper level of ignorance than just simply grasping to self. And at the deepest level, the distorted view of reality is grasping onto an independent me and an independent world. The, and so here in the Perfection of Wisdom teachings, this, he taught this idea of emptiness, that nothing exists independently. Everything's empty of independent existence. And so that's the view that we're going to look at now. And of course... Okay. <laughs> I forgot what I said now. <coughs> so in the perfection of wisdom teachings of the Buddha, he went on to say, well, there's a deeper level of ignorance than simply grasping to self. That at the deepest level, our distorted view of reality is grasping on to independent me, independent world. Grasping on to things existing independently. And he said here that nothing exists independently. And that's the view of emptiness. And that's what we're going to start to discuss now. Now, of course, in physics, the prevailing view generally in physics, in particularly classical physics, is that there is actually an objective world out there that we're trying to measure and better understand. So that's sort of in line with this view here in the Four Noble Truths. However, of course, not all physicists would accept that. In fact, there are many physicists who do not accept that. And before we begin our discussion on emptiness, I'd just like to quote from a couple of physicists their view about reality. Uh, first quote is from a theoretical physicist, John Wheeler, who was uh, at Princeton University. He says... Useful as it is under everyday circumstances to say that the world exists out there, independent of us, that view can no longer be upheld. There is a strange sense in which this is a participatory universe. And then quoting from uh, this quantum physicist Anton Seilinger, which I talked a bit about yesterday from University of Vienna, he says the following. One may be tempted to assume that whenever we ask questions of nature, of the world there outside, there is reality existing independently of what, we can, what can be said about it. We will now claim that such a position is void of any meaning. It is obvious that any property or feature of reality out there can only be based on information we receive. There cannot be any statement whatsoever about the world or about reality that is not based on such information. It therefore follows that the concept of a reality without at least the ability in principle to make statements about it, to obtain information about its features, is devoid of any possibility of confirmation or proof. This implies that the distinction between information, that is knowledge, and reality is devoid of any meaning. And then quoting from uh, Andre Linda, uh, who's professor of physics at Stanford University, he says the following. The current scientific model of the material world obeying laws of physics has been so successful that we forget about our starting point as conscious observers and conclude that matter is the only reality and that perceptions are only helpful in describing it. But in fact, we are substituting the reality of our experience of the universe with a conceptually contrived belief of an independently existing material world. Is it possible that consciousness, like time-space, has its own intrinsic degrees of freedom? And that, and that neglecting these will lead to a description of the universe that is fundamentally incomplete. 
What if our perceptions are as real, or maybe in a certain sense even more real, than material objects? The standard assumption is that consciousness, like space-time, before the invention of general relativity, plays a secondary subservient role, being just a function of matter and a tool for the description of the truly existent material world. But let us remember that our knowledge of the world begins not with matter, but with perceptions. Without, and here's something very interesting actually, without introducing an observer, we have a dead universe, in which, which does not evolve in time. And this re-emphasizes the role of the participant in the self-observing uh, universe of quantum cosmology. In fact, what they did, there's a branch called quantum cosmology where they apply quantum uh, principles to the macroscopic world, because usually quantum physics is about small. But some, some scientists use those principles and apply it to the larger world, and that's called quantum cosmology. And what they found is when they apply these principles to the macroscopic world, then they end up with, they, time drops out of the equation. They end up with like a static dead universe. And that time only comes in when, with the introduction of the observer. And that's what he's saying here. Um, the universe becomes alive, i.e. time dependent, only when one divides it into two parts, a subjective observer and the rest of the objective universe. And the wave function of the rest of the objective universe depends on the time measured by the observer. In other words, the evolution of the universe and everything in it, including life itself, is possible only with respect to the observer. And then lastly, um, quoting from this cognitive scientist, who also I, I mentioned earlier, I think Donald Hoffman from uh, University of California, he says, a as a conscious realist, I am postulating conscious experiences as ontological primitives, the most basic ingredients of the world. I'm claiming that experiences are the real coin of the realm. The experiences of everyday life, my real feelings of a headache, my real taste of chocolate, that is really the ultimate nature of reality. I believe that consciousness and its, con and its contents are all that exist. Space-time, matter and fields never were the fundamental denizens of the universe, but have always been, from the very beginning, among the humbler contents of consciousness, dependent on it for their very being. So while neuroscientists struggle to understand how there can be such a thing as first-person reality, quantum physicists have to grapple with the mystery of how there can be anything but first-person reality. Now explanation, please. Yes, so... One more, uh, one more uh, description here I want to give, and then we'll start the explanation. And this is coming from Alan Wallace from a, a book he wrote called Tibetan Buddhism from the Ground Up. And the section in the book is, is titled, What is Really There? And he says the following. Many of us believe that do we directly perceive objective physical phenomena with our five physical senses that the mental images we perceive via our senses are accurate representations of the objects we perceive. However, neurologist Antonio Damasio refutes this assumption, which is commonly called naive realism. So now he's quote, quoting the neurologist who says the following. When you and I look at an object outside ourselves, we form comparable images in our respective brains. We know this well because you and I can describe the object in very similar ways, down to fine details. But that does not mean that the image we see is the copy of whatever the object outside is like. Whatever it is like in absolute terms, we do not know. So now back to Alan Wallace. He says, in light of this neuroscientific view, with our five senses, we directly perceive images generated in the brain but these are not truly representations of anything existing independently of the brain. 
These sensory impressions of colours, sounds, smells and so on are no more tangible than thoughts or dreams. While we seem to experience colours and so on as they exist in the objective world, independent of our senses, this is an illusion, very much like a dream. Having determined that the reality we perceive depends on our sense faculties, what then really does exist outside our senses? When we close this book and leave the room, shutting the door behind us, what remains? It is an ancient question that has been asked since the time of the Greeks. What exists behind appearances? What really exists out there? This brings up a familiar problem. What happens when a tree falls and nobody is in the forest to watch it or hear it? Most people agree something happened. The tree trunk is on the ground, there is a big dent, things start to rot, and ants and termites live in the fallen trunk. But what happened? Western scientists have traditionally responded to this question by trying to find primary or intrinsic qualities of the falling tree that can be measured. Mass is one of those, the idea being that the tree has a quantifiable amount of stuff to it. <coughs> Speed is another quality that does not seem to depend on anyone's perception. Briefly considering the history of Western scientific thinking on this point may be a useful digression that may help us better understand the nature of emptiness. Also, by examining our cultural assumptions about the nature of reality, we can better understand and penetrate those assumptions, and by so doing, come to appreciate the Buddhist view. Since Galileo took his telescope and turned it on Jupiter, scientific thought has increasingly depended on the power of mechanical instruments. We get the sense, and it is widely promoted by science, that by using mechanical instruments and mathematics, we stop being subjective and instead become objective. Everyone knows the senses can be misleading, it is said, so let us dispense with the senses. They are giving us only appearances anyway, and we're trying to penetrate through those. The idea of objective measurement came to be strongly emphasised during the time of Galileo. And by the end of the 19th century, scientists felt the objective science of physics was virtually complete. The physics of the time was assumed, with very few exceptions, to be an absolute representation of what was really out there. At the beginning of the 20th century, this view began to break down. Scientists started to understand more clearly that their instruments of measurement were themselves contributing to the data they were detecting. But the real revolution came with the development of quantum physics, which investigates the very smallest components of physical reality. It is here that the participatory nature of measurement and experimentation becomes most obvious. In quantum mechanics, attributes of mass, speed, shape, and location vanish as purely objective entities. All of them can only be seen in relationship to the methods of measurement. As the renowned physicist Werner Heisenberg said, what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. As scientists look still deeper, they also started questioning the objectivity of the analytical tools they use. Mathematics, for instance, is one more human creation. Euclidean geometry is only one of a theoretically infinite number of geometries that can be used, and the same goes for algebra and for various logic systems. The subjective element seems to be inescapable on all fronts. In no facet of science, whether we are dealing with astronomy, physics or medicine, do we get even one bit of information about any reality existing independently of our modes of questioning. All our sensory experience consists of experiences that are contingent upon our sense faculties. Even by reducing everything to the subatomic level of electrons, quarks and so forth, we are still left with nothing but appearances. What is inescapable is that all we know of the world, theoretically and empirically, consists of appearances to the mind. 
We have access to nothing else. Understanding this, the concept of reification becomes universally applicable. In the same way that we look out on the world and view perceived objects as if they existed inherently in objective space, so too do we view things like electrons and sound waves as if they existed independently of our conceptions of them. Perceived objects exist in relation to the conceptual schemata within which they are understood. We reify an object by removing it from its context by ignoring the subjective influences of perception and conception. So let's try and explain some of that. <laughs> um, first, first, good. It's too much. Right. So it's running so much. Yeah. So that's the idea: is just to throw that out there to stimulate the mind. Now we'll try to explain it. <laughs> I mean, unless you've already contemplated this, it'd be unrealistic to think, yeah, I, I understand that. But not so good sure, sure. can follow you sure. the world and sure. the concept and everything together. Sure, and even if I spoke slowly, we, you probably wouldn't follow very well. So that's why we're going to explain now. Okay, it was Exactly. I mean, even in Hebrew, it may be difficult to follow. <laughs> okay, so what we're talking here about is independent existence. that there really does appear to be an independent me here, there appears to be an independent objective world out there. And when this is described in the Buddhist texts, there are a number of terms used to describe this. Probably the most common term you'll see is inherent existence. How, does anyone, how do you normally translate that in Hebrew? Okay, I'll explain what it means in English and then you can see whether the Hebrew word sort of matches that. Inherent existence has the idea that things are self-existent, that everything has its own unique identity of being that thing, that the world is made up of many separate, discrete things, Everyone ha each one having its own unique identity. That's inherent existence. There's another term that's often used is existing from its own side. That has the idea or the connotation of things not needing an observer to exist. They simply exist there from their own side without the need of an observer. Another term that's commonly used is true existence. Generally, something is true if it doesn't deceive us. Now, things appear to exist completely independent of us. If that's really how they existed, they would be true, meaning they wouldn't be deceiving us. So true existence means existing in the same way in which it appears. So each one of these three terms is describing the same thing. Independent existence from a slightly different angle, slightly different perspective. So they mean all the same things. Independent existence. There are some other terms used, um, a number of other terms, but probably these are the three most widely used terms 
to describe this. Now, of course, the assertion here is that 